Coming up on Wrestling Life. If you've ever been to TV or if you watch any behind the scenes thing from WWE, there's signage everywhere. There's catering, there's seamstress, there's Vince's office, there's this, that, and the other thing. And we're walking into a part of the building where I'm seeing less and less signage. <laughs> I'm just like, man, if we walk into a room and there's plastic on the floor, I'm running. You know, like, <laughs> if this is like a, a mob hit, I'm, I'm out of here, right? You know, I grew up in Atlantic City. I know what the mob does. Welcome to Wrestling Life with Ben Veal, the show that features real talk from real talent. So excited to have my guest on for today's show. He is an ECW original and one of the most beloved characters from the Land of Extreme's golden era. He also went on to have two runs with the World Wrestling Federation, first during the Attitude Era and later when WWE reprised ECW for One Night Stand. We'll be talking all about that today. He's a founding member of the Blue World Order, Here's the blue guy. Here's Brian Heffron, better known to all of us wrestling fans as the Blue Meanie. Brian, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you? How you doing, my friend? I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad we're here. It's a, it's a beautiful day out. The sun's out. It's getting warmer. The sun's out a little bit longer. A couple of weeks away from Mania. Uh, Philly's going to be busy. Here we are. We're about to have a great conversation. Uh, life could be better. Absolutely. I'm I'm there with everything apart from the good weather. It's still miserable weather here. I mean, breaking breaking the fourth wall of broadcasting because it'll be a couple of months before this airs. But um we are, you know, we're recording this on the eve of of Philadelphia being taken over for WrestleMania 40. Um just speaking off air, this is my first ever WrestleMania as a fan, and I I can't wait. Awesome. But um I'm also super excited to head to Philly for the first time because you know it's such a incredible wrestling city with such rich history i mean what does it mean for you as someone who spent pretty much your whole life in philly um to have this huge international spotlight shone on your home city it's it's awesome and uh i i want to try to be a, a good ambassador for uh the city like you said it, it's it's got a rich history i mean wwwf you know in the 70s did all their television here in Philly. Um, you know, there's, you know, spectrum wrestling, uh, you know, the NWA started running here. Uh, Philly was the litmus, te- uh, like early litmus test for like the pre Monday night wars testing when WWE and NWA would purposely run Philly in the same night at the same time to see how they would draw, you know? Wow. Uh, so, uh, you know, you know, flash forward, you know, through ECW, through everything, you know, and, uh, WrestleMania is coming back at long overdue. Uh, last time WrestleMania was here was 15, which was my one and only WrestleMania, but, uh, it's awesome. You know, uh, WrestleMania does wonderful things for the towns that for the cities that it goes to. And, uh, you know, I I'm looking forward to meeting people from all over the country, all over the world, you know, to come to my city and, um, you know, it, it's going to be awesome. You know, it's just, uh, it seemed like one of those things were like, man, I wish WrestleMania would come back to Philly. And then they announced WrestleMania is coming back to Philly. And then you're like, wow, that's in a couple of weeks. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> not, time has just flown by so, so quickly, but, uh, it's going to be awesome. And when it's over, like, man, that, that, that went by way too quick. Yeah, it's. I mean, the thing. The thing is, I've tried to explain WrestleMania to people who don't necessarily follow wrestling and what I'm going to do. And it's not a wrestling show. It's. It's like a traveling wrestling festival, isn't it? Now it's like a. It's like a city takeover for a whole week. It's um, yeah. pretty bonkers. Yeah, it is. And uh, I guess it. I mean, WrestleMania initially is supposed to be like, you know, the Super Bowl for professional wrestling, and. You know, you see what happens when a Super Bowl goes to a town and the money it generates for the town and brings, you know, helps the economy. WrestleMania is the same way, you know, there's going to be, I thought there was going to be wrestling from like Wednesday till Monday. And I'm finding out there shows Monday and Tuesday as well. I'm like, good Lord. You know, (laughs) like, where's that building? I've been here most of my life. I've never heard of that building, (laughs) you know, but Hey, they're going to have wrestling there. Okay, cool. That's crazy. So you're saying about you're saying about kind of Philly in the WWF days, I and mean, then obviously VCW days. 
is there something you know i always used to see on the ecw shows there was obviously a very rabid loyal fan base but is there a would you describe the philly crowd as a, a kind of a philly audience as different to any other audience in terms of kind of how they respond to wrestling and what's special about your homegrown audience just uh the philly crowds are just um philadelphia itself is a, a blue collar hard-working town you know guys going to work in factories and putting their you know sandwich in a lunchbox and putting in their hours and so when they come home and they want to wind down they just want to watch some good sports you know they just want to be entertained you know here in philly you know philly's got five sports we got football baseball hockey basketball and uh sorry soccer uh yeah. <laughs> and uh we want you know the best bang for our buck you know we want we want a you know reward for our investment of time and the same goes for wrestling um oh you know back before you know we got a, a soccer team i want to say i often joke that ecw was the the fifth sports team in in philadelphia yeah but you know the the same fans who watch all those sports are the same people who watch watch dcw and uh it's just hey we just want we want to want to be rewarded for giving you our time we you know we keep the receipts you know so um i you know i anytime i go over to the uk i i feel a similar vibe between like a, a uk crowd and a, a philly crowd you know uh I, I i've been to you know manchester doncaster london uh and just like you know the the passion and 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 the wit the very uh, sharp wit of the crowd you know whether it's chance or anything like that i'm like man this feels like philly yeah uh, so I, I feel kinship at, to uh you know the uk anytime i go over there but oh we you know, will, we will we will let you know how we feel about any any match oh, or yeah. performer quite happily even if it's completely <laughs> off script i remember um i remember being at so clash at the castle the, the big um show they, wwe did in cardiff i mean a that was fascinating because that was a complete city takeover i know that the, the kind of welsh council bid very hard to get you know it in cardiff as opposed to manchester or london and it was incredible when you got off the train in cardiff because it was literally you know wall to wall wwe banners flags it was they had like an undertaker experience they had the lorries it was it was for three days it was just wrestling um but also i remember that crowd and i remember like Bailey, who was like a, a full on heel, trying to be a full on heel at that point, and just 20 minutes of that match, just everyone, everyone singing, hey, hey, Bailey. And like you just mm. see her trying. Uh, it's like you could see her trying not to smile by the fact she had 60,000 people who just adored her. And um, yeah, we we won't we won't follow the script in, in the UK, and nor should we. And I'm glad you bring it up because um, I was going to ask you about that. I. You've mentioned Doncaster, so clearly you remember. I, I met you and Nova at that 1PW show in 2009, and it was just incredible. I can't remember what the show was called, but I remember they'd, they'd flown over you two. Uh, there was Sandman, Jerry Lynn, Guido, Scorpio. They, I don't know if you remember, but they kind of done a really cool job of recreating VCW sets. So they had like the brick entrance and they, yeah. uh, Sandman's Metallica music and all that stuff. It, it was the place for someone that never got to do ECW. It was. I felt like it was the closest I'd ever got to like an authentic ECW experience. I mean, what what can you remember that night and what that was like for you being part of that? Oh, it was awesome. Uh, you know, like uh, yeah, the it, ECW was very special. And uh, you know, after ECW closed, we did a lot of shows where people booked a lot of these ECW guys on the same show, and we were like, oh, look at these guys cl clinging on to their glory days, and this. It's like, no, we we're a family we, we genuinely love working together we love doing things together if you want to call an extreme reunion that's fine but as long as i'm sharing the same locker room with the the, the same folks that you know i went through a war with in ecw I, i'll be there all the time you know so uh that night for uh 1pw was great um you know uh just you go over there be with my friends uh from ECW, I have, I have friends in England too, so it's a good uh, dual opportunity to uh, be with the people I worked with and be with my friends who I only know known from social media. Well, whatever you call social media back then, I don't know if I don't know if pre-social media, yeah, yeah, 
yeah, MySpace, whatever. <laughs> it's, you know, hey, can't knock MySpace. That's where I met Mrs. Meanie. So it's just, ah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, that was a, that was a cool night to, uh, share a locker room with the, uh, you know, that crowd, uh, share the lock, locker room with those folks and wrestle in front of that Doncaster crowd. Cause that Doncaster crowd was so much fun. Yeah. Like you said, they didn't stick to the script, you know, all those early one PW shows as well. And, you know, chanting stuff and, um, and that's why I was like, yeah, man, this feels just like Philly. You know, those, those shows were great. You can't, you can't just say that and then kind of gloss over it. I've got to ask you about Mrs. Meany. So how, how did, how and when did you two meet and how did, how did MySpace play a role in that? Oh, I just, um, uh, early days, uh, well, MySpace was a thing well, well before Facebook or Twitter and, um, she was looking through MySpace and back in the day on MySpace, there was this, this section people you'd like to meet. I, I'd be like Van Halen. And then I put uh, Art Bell. Okay. And Art, <clears throat> Art Bell was a, I was a huge fan of Art Bell because he, I'm into all that stuff. I'm into UFOs, ghosts, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Gar Bell was a great travel companion. If you're, you're driving, to another town after a show and you, you're flipping around the radio and there's Art Bell on the radio. He's got that deep voice, like from the kingdom of nigh, you know, <laughs> West of the Rockies. And you know, you feel like somebody's in the car with you while yeah. you're you know, driving 300 miles. So she saw that and she was like, Oh wow. Somebody else knows about Art Bell and had no idea who I was at the time. And then reached out and we just started talking and, uh, we would talk, uh, on MySpace, and then it, we graduated to AOL Instant Messenger. Ooh. And, and uh, we, we started talking on the phone. And uh, one day I'd say, Hey, you know, I'm gonna come up and let's let's hang out. And you know, it was it was uh, she she's from Connecticut, which is like 180 miles from here. Yeah, one day we're up on the phone, I'm like, You know what? What are you doing? I'm coming up. And I literally walked down my house, got in the car, drove. I was like, I was like 20 minutes from my house, so I was like, Oh, I'm about 20 minutes from your house. I'll see you in a couple minutes. Yeah. And hung out in that. <laughs> I had her come down to be uh, my date for new year's. And then, um, she came down to be my date for Valentine's day and never went home. Wow. You know, and she's been my best friend. Um, uh, there, you know, she li lived with me for like two months and my health took a really bad turn. Um, and the day anniversary of that's coming up, which is, uh, around March 15th, 16th, you know, St. Mm -hmm. Patrick's day. And, uh, one day I just woke up and I had a bad fever shakes, everything. And trying to be a stupid man. I just tried to ride it out. Oh, it's just a flu. I'll just ride it out. And, you know, a couple of days go by and I'm coughing up blood. And I'm like, Ooh, go to the, you know, go to the hospital. And they're like, you're going to be here for a little while. And you know, I'm sitting there in the hospital sweating. My face has exploded. Yeah, you know, uh, and I'm coughing up blood and she's holding the, the thing underneath my head. Yeah, you know, she's oh. wiping my head down. I was like, I'm sitting there. I was like, she could, could have easily just left. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a you proper kick. That's a keeper put a ring on it moment. That is, isn't it? Yeah. I've had people leave me in my, my worst times, but she stayed. And, uh, it's like that story of, you know, taking the thorn out of the lion's paw. <laughs> you yeah. know, just I don't know how the story goes, but she she stuck with me, and uh, we're going on eighteen years. Wow. So it's, congrats! Oh, thank you. But uh, yeah, my 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 best friend. You know and what? So how how far was it into your relationship before she discovered this kind of blue alter ego? When when does that crop up in a conversation? Well, she she eventually figured it out. Um, she was an attitude error kid, and uh, she caught like the tail end of ECW. And then she was like, oh, oh, oh. It's this dude that I, looks like you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, you know, to this day, people put like random wrestlers as their, you know, uh, profile pick and it's not them. And they're just happy to be fans. You know, this guy could have been a Blue Meanie fan or whatever. But, uh, you know, her, her family and friends are like, oh, no, man, you better not go to Philly. This What if this guy's a lunatic? She's like, he's on TV. He's like, yeah, there's a lot of lunatics on TV, you know. but. <laughs> It worked out, you know, uh, she's been my best friend for 18 years and, 
me and her family get along awesomely and uh it, it's it's just worked out you know and uh you know uh she uh she figured out who i was and what i did and came along to the shows i often joke now that she knows almost about almost as much about wrestling as some of the guys breaking in today you know because <laughs> she's, she's been around me she's been around she's been around al snow she's been around everybody she's sat in on conversations you know and just you know listened so yeah. uh yes she's she's technically a wrestler <laughs> <laughs> well i'm glad you bring up al snow because I, I just have the you know a real privilege of spending some time with with al and his wife jessica when they're over in in manchester and you know i could i could listen to that guy talk about wrestling all day and all night long um you know, and it's, it's been awesome to see in the last year or so with OVW and all the huge mainstream extra exposure they've had through through Netflix and wrestlers. Um, I know you trained with Al back in in the very early days. Um, mm -hmm. How was Al as a trainer and what are some of the kind of learnings you took away from him that you would apply in your career? Yeah, I was very fortunate. Um, Al hadn't, Al had been, you know, by the time I started training with Al, he had been already been around for, 10 years maybe he started mm -hmm. wrestling too i went to him in 90 well then 12 years i went to him in 94 and um you know i had a chance like when not only did i move out there to train with him i lived in the school you know it was, wow, it was this okay. huge it used to be a masonic temple where like there was a an auditorium where the ring was whoever the masons do they had an <laughs> auditorium there which kind of looked like a miniature version of Manhattan Center where the early kind of, were all kind of puts ECW all. in perspective, doesn't it? Whatever happened at ECW is probably pales in comparison to what was happening in that temple back in the day. Oh my god. I can only imagine. <laughs> I can only imagine. I can only speculate. But um yeah, and, I, and there there's like bedrooms and all so I lived in the school. And the benefit of that was Al had a a routine, you know, he would have Monday night, uh, a Monday class i mean sorry morning class he would have morning classes and evening classes because he would have you know local kids but then kids would come down from uh canada you know ohio you know ohio kentucky indiana he had people coming from all over the place so if your schedule was more towards training in the morning or training at night you were covered so i did both i i, I would do the morning sessions and the night sessions so I was training twice a day and, uh, you know, five days a week. And then if Al had a booking that weekend, we would take that day off. But, and I would go on the road trip with him to whatever show he was on. And I learned, I, I always, always say, I learned more. I learned just as much in those car rides as I did of him going, all right, this is locking up. Okay. This is a headlock sitting in the car with Al for two, three hours each way talking about wrestling and uh going to watch him wrestle and watching him purposely work something into his match that night that he had trained me during the week to put it in proper perspective i mean what what better way to learn than be shown something you talk about in the car ride go watch the man wrestle and then he does that thing and on the ride on the ride back you know to ohio he goes do you uh, notice anything about my match? Ah, the thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See how I worked it. And it was just, it was awesome, you know. Uh, and the benefit about breaking in back then is there weren't any distractions. There's no cell phones. You know, you go in a car right now, everybody's staring at the phone. Mm. Back then, we had to talk to each other. <laughs> and, <laughs> Much <know>. of that. <laughs> yeah. Imagine talking to the person, you know, instead of texting the person across the room that you're in the same room with, you know, where do you want to go to dinner? You know, you could just go, Hey, what do you want for dinner? You know, but, uh, back then we were forced to talk to each other in the car and bond and, you know, and that's, you know, another reason why, you know, the ECW locker room was so special. We, we bonded, you know, we weren't sitting there just staring at phones. We're in the room talking, joking, playing practical jokes or whatever. And, uh, but Al was an awesome trainer. You know, I've trained with him every morning, every evening. And I was with him for about a year and he was getting me uh bookings for, you know, Dan Severin, mm -hmm. 
who was one of his students uh was running shows or running sold shows sabu started running shows and they would all use al students so i was working for sabu i was working for dan severn and then uh mike samples in in uh, indianapolis called al and hey go drive to uh indiana to wrestle but it was it got to be like a year and i was like hey look been here a year you know it's it's good i'm getting you all these bookings and but it, i think it's time for you to go back home and learn how to hustle and, and learn how to get your own bookings like mm. so i you know i packed up my car i moved back home i would drive to baltimore i would drive to north jersey i would drive start driving everywhere just showing up at shows i would look at the newsletters okay what's in the area show up with my bag you know i was like you know if you go to a wow. leave your bag in the car introduce yourself to everybody say hey I, i'm sure you got a, a full card anything comes up i you know i have my stuff in the car if you, you need anybody and a lot of times that worked where I would go to work, you go to, to a Dennis Corluzzo show in New Jersey and he'd be like, ah, so-and-so stuck in traffic. Brian, go get your stuff. You're on your Amazing. third match. You know, you just learn how to the hustle and, and work. And, you know, I would send out like press kits. So, you know, a VHS tape with a eight by 10, this, that other thing. And just, I did that for about <clears throat> a year and a half. Well, I was in the business a year and a half before I got into ECW and then, um, went to ECW and things really kick started off right there. But I owe all that to learning from Al, you know, Al's Al's that bridge between the old school and the, and the, and the current wrestling. He's that bridge, you know, he, where in 82, he's working with all the old school stuff guys and he broke in the old school way. And now he can bring, still bring that knowledge to anybody, you know, breaking into the business now. I think that's one of the things that's overlooked about Al by many people because obviously but for people that have only kind of seen his his kind of career on a bigger stage, you know, he kind of first came into the into WWF probably around 1995 with the with the Avatar gimmick. But um, yeah. you know, long standing veteran before that was already training people, but you know, break into the business with the likes of Bobo Brazil. So, you know, <laughs> such a you know, such a such an incredible kind of tenure he'd had before he even got to the I guess the big dance. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to ask about, so you, you said about kind of joining the ECW. Um, my, my understanding and correct me if I'm wrong here, Brian, but is that, is that Raven and Stevie Richards were both pretty pivotal to your, your path into ECW. And I, I had a conversation not long ago with, with Lodi on this show. And he was talking about, he shared quite a similar story about how Raven was instrumental in paving his road into WCW and him ended up being on WCW pay-per-views very, very quickly, probably before he was ready. Um, it seems to me that Scott, Scott, Scott Levy, the man, not the character that we all know as Raven, um, seems to have played a very big role in helping a lot of talent along the way. Like what are your, what are your memories of, I guess, what are your first memories of meeting with Raven and Stevie? And, and is that a fair assessment about him as a man? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Like I said, I, I moved back east from Ohio and I start showing up to shows and there's three shows that really cemented, you know, me going to ECW. There's a show in Baltimore, a promoter named Dennis Whipwreck, who Mikey Whipwreck's name was kind of a takeoff of. Okay. There's a show where, <laughs> you know, they would name uh, certain wrestlers after promoters, you know. So, you know, instead of Joel Goodhart, there was Joel Hartgood, you know, and, you know. <laughs> stuff like that and then i did a show in west virginia uh for a guy named tyler cates and then i had a buddy orm connors who was running shows out of pittsburgh and i worked for him a couple times when i was still at al's and i had moved back east and i, I genuinely liked him we were both young dudes you know in the wrestling business he's a promoter i'm a wrestler i said hey man i i, I see you got two shows coming up I know they're booked. I'm just going to come out and hang out. I'm just coming out to hang out. No pressure. You know, just, I just want to be around. So I took it and my car was, it was shot. I mean, my car was in the shop at the time. So I took like a six hour Greyhound bus ride out to, uh, from Philly to Pittsburgh. And 
his roommates picked me up and I, I went to the first night show and he threw me a bone. And he was like, Hey, you're working, uh, you're working Batman. <laughs> there's, a local, there's a local, uh, in the uh, local wrestling veteran, I should say named TC Reynolds. He was like the local doink or right. Wrestled a TC right this night. He was wrestling as Batman. And uh, he's like, you're wrestling Batman. I was like, fine. Cool. Thank you. <clears throat> and, uh, I wrestled Batman match is okay. <laughs> you know, um, but after the match, I go in the locker room and, you know, I was always taught, you know, watch the rest of the show. So I knew Raven was on that show with Stevie. Oh, and Raven and Stevie were on shows in Baltimore, West Virginia. They were on this show as well. And Raven was working. Somebody I, I went to Al school with named uh, Ray, the crippler Roberts. And I was like, this, this is going to be interesting. Ray, Ray Roberts was an interesting person. Um, he had done time in prison and then he got out of prison. And he wanted to become a wrestler. And right. for some reason he got over like a million bucks in that area. Bands just took to him. And it's like, we're all like, all right, this is cool. So he's wrestling Raven that night. And I went, Oh, this is going to be good. So I watched the match and then, uh, Raven comes back through the locker room. I go, Oh, uh, I really enjoyed your match. He goes, Hey kid, nice moon's full. I went, Oh, he watched my match. So, um, you know, the next day we went to lunch and he pitched the idea for, you know, Stevie, uh, you know, Steve Richards was his lackey and they wanted to have a, a lackey for a lackey. And, uh, they're like, you fit the, the description and they, they had a guy in mind, but he couldn't wrestle. He wasn't a wrestler, but he dwarfed me. And, but, uh, they wanted somebody who can, you know, go in the ring, take bumps, you know, you know, feed in for like, you know, salmon or whoever. And I was like, I'll be in ECW, right? They're like, he's like, yeah, yeah. He goes, but you have to wear a half shirt Daisy, Daisy Dukes. I go, but I'll be in ECW, right? He'd be like, he's like, yeah. I was like, I'm in, I'm cool. And then, um, I debuted October 95 and then, uh, that footage never aired because there was, uh, the fire incident between Terry Funk and Cactus Jack. Uh, okay. So my debut went bye-bye. So, uh, in the meantime, they had to re-debut. They were thinking of stuff. Raven was thinking of, you know, things and he, uh, thought of the, the, the blue meanie character from the yellow submarine, the Beatles movie, yeah, Beatles cartoon. <clears throat> He's like, Hey, uh, and again, we were working from norm and we're driving home in a blizzard and, uh, back to Raven's place and, uh, five hour drive in, the, in a blizzard, which is fun. And, uh, he goes, Hey, uh, did you ever see the yellow submarine? I was like, yeah, when I was a kid. Uh, you remember the blue meanies? Yeah, vaguely. And he's like, well, you're going to be the blue meanie. And he starts selling me on it. He's like, you're going to want to paint your whole body blue, but just do your hair. I was like, I'll be in ECW, right? And he goes, yeah. I'm like, all right. Okay, cool. I'm in, you know? And then, um, November to remember 95, I debuted as the blue meanie at the ECW arena. And just like Al, you know, those car rides with Raven, I've learned so much just from the art of doing a promo from the art of timing and, you know, letting things breathe and, you know, uh, stuff like that. Yes. A lot of stuff I, I similarly, you know, learned from Paul Heyman, you know, timing, doing promos, stuff like that. <clears throat> but if it wasn't for Raven, you know, Stevie pitching me to Raven, Raven watching my match, and then both of them pitching me to Paul, I don't know where my career would be or I don't, I don't I don't know if I'd be here talking to you. I don't know what, where my, tra my trajectory would have gone, but Raven was a huge part of that. And I learned so much from him and I owe a lot to him. You know, I broke in with Al, but I had so many good mentors, you know, I mean, every good wrestler is a mutt, you know, they're a little bit of, you know, different leaves from different trees. So I, I got to sit under Raven's learning tree for, you know, a good couple of years. And, uh, you know, he came up with so many different characters. He came up with the Blue Meanie. He helped Steve Richards. He came, you know, Kimono Wanalea. The, he came up with the Dudley gimmick. And he's always willing to teach people who are willing to listen. Mm. You know, and that's an important thing. You got to be willing to listen and uh, learn. I was more than willing to listen. So uh, he's one of the best minds in the business. And, uh, you know, just... I mean, stuff they do down at the performance center, uh, you know, the skull sessions with 
working on promos and uh, I, I was doing that with Raven in 95, you know, sitting, yeah. standing in the middle of the living room and all right, blue me, do a promo about this, that, and the other thing and in character, you'd have to do a promo on the fly. And that was all, you know, thanks to Raven and him coaching me, you know, to do that. But yeah, he's got his fingerprints all on a lot of different things in this business. And, and uh, you know, hopefully he gets a little bit more recognition for it. Hey guys, it is hardcore country and 11 time women's world champion, Mickey James. And gentlemen, we have a problem. Recent studies have shown that testosterone levels are falling in men across the globe. Low testosterone is linked to depression, low sex drive, and weight gain. So it's really important to stay on top of it. Now you could go to a TRT clinic, but let's face it, it's expensive, awkward, and most cases not even necessary. You just need to stimulate your body's own natural testosterone production. That's why it's time to check out the ultimate test stack at LegacySubs.com. The majority of testosterone release occurs while you sleep, which is why the ultimate test stack features our best-selling sleep aid, Recovery PM. So Test X9 stimulates testosterone, T-Assist inhibits estrogen, and Recovery PM gives you the best night's sleep you've ever had. You're gonna feel like a new man after trying the Ultimate Test Act for 30 days, I guarantee. And if you don't believe me, check out all the verified five-star reviews on Top Rated. Legacy Sports Nutrition is founded by myself and my husband, three-time world champion and SmackDown general manager, Nick Aldis. We personally use these products ourselves. And if you need more assurance, they are NSF certified, third-party lab tested, and made in the USA in an FDA inspected facility. And because you listen to this show, you can save 10% off your entire order at LegacySubs.com now by using the code Wrestling Life at checkout. That's Wrestling Life, all caps, don't forget, and LegacySupps.com. L E G A C Y S U P P S.com. It's time to level up with Legacy. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. I think I think he's he's one of those names and, and talents that, you know, is is really overlooked in terms of his legacy of in a business and you know what an incredible i mean i i can't think of ecw without immediately thinking of raven the two are just so synonymous and intertwined and um but you know you had you obviously learned from some incredible minds and were surrounded by the likes of you know you've mentioned Al, you've mentioned raven you've mentioned paul Heyman. But at the end of the day, you know, the reason we're sitting here in 2024 having this conversation is because you were the one that made the Blue Meanie and brought the Blue Meanie to life. And, you know, you, you put the energy and the passion into that character to make it such a, a big part of, of that era. How, how, how would you describe, you know, when, when you kind of, you first have the idea pitched and it was all very well, you're going to be this, you know, blue guy or whatever, but. But for you, what is the essence of a Blue Meanie character? Like, whenever you think back in your career, like, how would you describe your character? Uh, when I first started, I was almost, a you know, I was almost exactly that character from the movie. But <clears throat> as we start moving on and uh, doing parodies, you know, growing up, you know, I was a huge fan of wrestling, but I was also a huge fan of stand-up comedy and a whole bunch of different things. And, um, more of myself started coming out in the character, you know, you know, once we start doing, you know, blue dust, uh, Baron Von Stevie, Colonel Demini, the blue Meanie bloods, you know, uh, uh, I was Sir Meanie and Lord Stevie, uh, just, and I could just be that, you know, I could bring in my other influences from like comedy. You know, I grew up a huge fan of George Carlin. And if you ever seen a George Carlin stand up that, you know, he's always doing faces like, you know, yeah. I know this is a podcast, but you know, he, he's big on the facials and stuff like that. And I would work that in my routine, you know, the blue meanie face, you know, the, that, that's a, that's a tribute to my, uh, my grandfather, you know, uh, I remember being a kid in my, in my crib, looking up and my grandfather looking at me, looking down at me and, you know, going, 
you know, making faces like that. And somewhere I, I posted, I found a photo of us both doing the face as when I was a kid, but I incorporated that into my character. So the character of the blue meanie is just basically a fun, loving mischief, mischievous character. But, uh, when it comes to, when it comes time to be serious, he could be serious, you know, uh, I'll come to the ring. I'll do the meanie dance, this, that, and the other thing. But once the heel starts doing things, uh, heelish, I'll reply in kind to whatever the heel's doing. And then, you know, you know, uh, take it a little bit serious, but it's it the character's always just been, I'd like to say I'm, I'm in Philly. We got a uh, sports, we got sports mask, sports mascots like the Philly fanatic or gritty. I'd like to think I am the pro wrestling equivalent of gritty or the Philly fanatic, you know, you know, other guys were doing all these crazy things and, you know, sacrificing their, their bodies, you know, Paul and Raven would have us go out there and do something to lighten the mood mm. in order to, you know, people, people be right here from like whatever was going on. All right, here comes something to make you laugh to get your mind all, you know, in a different mood. So when the next thing happens, you're not burnt out. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I'm sorry. Sorry. I was just going to say, I probably get the analogy wrong, but I, th I think it was Bret Hart who once kind of described a wrestling show as it's a bit like a, a bit like a menu and you have to yeah. have the different courses. And if you have three hours of people being thrown through tables or three hours of technical masterclasses, it just gets too much. Like for me, sometimes watching, um, and not to bash them because I love the product, but like, for example, sometimes I might watch an AEW show and I might get a bit burned out by the kind of pace of match after match after match. Yeah. It's you, you need the light relief. You need, you need for segments, you know, it can go too far the other way. And arguably it did during the attitude era, but you, you need the balance, don't you? And I think what you were bringing was a lot of that balance. And um, going back to what you were saying about the expressions. I mean, that, that kind of reminds me of, um, you know, what a few of the names that I've I've spoken to who let, who were under the learning tree of William Regal have kind of told me about that kind of yeah. work in the work in the UK Butlin circuit. Like you're, you know, those kind of big animated facial expressions really play into the fact that you're not always performing to an informed audience, are you? Like with ECW, obviously you were, but when you go to the big stage of WWF, you are performing to the dads and the mums who've been dragged along, aren't you? And all these people who have no interest in wrestling, but are there under duress. And <laughs> it, it, which was my sister many, many times. I uh, that was she, my grandparents. <laughs> I, I, remember, I remember my sister falling asleep in the middle of um, a steel cage match between Triple H and The Rock for the WWF title in, in, in the UK. And there she was next to me snoring away. Um, but, you know, you're... You know, there's a really important role there, isn't it? And it's not just the comedy and the light relief, but also just kind of connecting with people emotionally and giving them something beyond the wrestling. And I think that's something that you were always great at. I and I appreciate those kind of words. It's just, and I was that wrestling fan. You know, that's sometimes the best wrestlers are the people who are the biggest fans. You know, uh, what, what what did I like as a fan? What this that and the other thing? You know. William Ringel, you bring that up. He, he was, he was tremendous. And I was, I was fortunate enough to work with him, but he would told, he told me a lot of the, the facial expressions he did was from people he watched, you know, on TV over there in, in the UK. And I, I'm, I'm dying because I can't think of the names, but like, you know, with the, you know, the expression where, you know, you're like, you know, just, I think, yeah, this, I, think he, I think he was a big fan of the carry on movies, which were huge over here in the seventies. Yeah, um, which yeah. which were very exaggerated, but always family friendly, but always full of sexual innuendo. Okay, but, yeah. but they'd still be played at mid afternoon, and we'd all watch them as a family. But they were just complete smut. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great word. I've heard that one in a while, but mm. yeah, just uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we're talking about you know how what my character brought you know levity you know to a wrestling event, and you know uh, it's just. Oh, like I was saying, I, I was a fan and, you know, as a fan, I liked comedic moments, you know? So when I got to, you know, when that cart was dealt to me, I was more and willing, more, uh, more ready and willing to go that route to where, you know, there'll be times where we, we wanted to do something and we wanted to include somebody in our, 
our deal and somebody would be like, Oh, I can't, I can't do that. Why not? It's funny. It's fun. You just, I'm a serious wrestler. Get the, you know, get out of here. You know, I'm trying not to swear, but yeah, but you know, th- 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 there's people who got in on our act and uh, had fun, you know, yeah. just so that we, we, we were the fun. We were the, uh, the dog and pony show as Raven like to put it, you know, there'll be, you know, times where, you know, one of my favorite memories, uh, we were at the Lulu temple in Plymouth meeting, which is 20 minutes outside of Philly. And, uh, I'm Colonel Domini and, uh, I want to see Stevie is Baron von Stevie. <laughs> we're doing our promo and Raven's in the corner, sitting in the corner, like, you know, the Jake, the snake pose and, I glance over and I see Brian, uh, Brian Lee, Lee, uh, Brian Lee lean into Raven and you know, just whispers in his ear. And you just see Raven who had it, all his hair in his face. And you just see his shoulders going like, <laughs> and, and what's the language parameters on here? Can oh, I say, can I say what you need to say? It's all good. And we get back to the locker room and Raven's like, I'm sitting there and, and Brian Lee get leans and goes, they're fucking killing me, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Brian Lee, this, the bulldozer, this, this lean, oh, they're fucking killing me, man. And then Raven just dies laughing while we we're doing our shtick and just things like that. That's what we did. You know, there's yeah. one show, dude, there was one show at the, uh, and it might've been that show too. Me and Stevie were on that show at least five times. Uh, I think Stevie had a match. I might have had a match. We came out with Raven and we came out with Mick Foley. And uh Mick Foley called out Sabu and we're at this Lulu Temple where they have there's a stage and I'm sure they had plays and there's like an Aladdin set. Yeah. And I grabbed the one we grabbed the one cardboard cutout from Aladdin and we bring it out as if we're bringing Sabu to the ring. He starts wrestling this cardboard cutout. It's just amazing stuff. If you can ever find a fan cam yeah. footage of that, just and that's you know what we got to do in ECW. We got to bring you know a, a happy distraction you know in between the chaos. And I I hear you when you say you can watch certain you know you can watch certain shows and you get burnt out because you know it's either all one thing or you know the menu you know uh, analogy is perfect. I always said wrestling should be like a bowl of checks mix. That's my analogy <laughs> where. Okay, I don't like the pretzels, but I really like that cereal. I really like the peanuts, you know. You know, I'll, t- I'll take the pretzels and throw them over my shoulder or whatever. But you get this whole thing put together like a buffet. Pick and choose what you like. Yeah. All right, this match is on. I'm not too excited. Maybe I'll go. It's like when a band says, here's a song from our new album, and everybody runs to the bathroom. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. Take, yeah. You know, a bathroom break, you know. But a perfect wrestling show should have a little bit of everything. Yeah, you know, peaks, pe- peaks and valleys, you know, and bring them up, bring them down, and then you know, work to the grand finale in, in the main event you know, without and, and it, burning them out. You know, ECW was amazing at that. I remember, I remember first discovering it in, in you know, probably maybe '96 that I first got a kind of VHS, kind of classic kind of tape trader, like someone posted me a VHS in the UK, and. You know, it t- took a bit of an adjustment to get past the production values because obviously I grew up on, you know, I grew up on WWF. The first show I'd ever seen was SummerSlam 92 at Wembley Stadium. I'm, I'm used nice. to a certain kind of thing. And you see ECW and you're a bit like, what is this to start off? Um, but then I was just so absorbed. And I, I was obsessed with that product from probably 96 right until 2001. And that's never, you know, my, my fandom for ECW has has never changed you know it's a privilege speaking to you today i loved um had a great chat with stevie last year not long after his you know a few months after his spine infection i mean he's just yeah great great guy and i'm so pleased to see scary him stuff man recovering. That's, that's, really scary that's... yeah but uh, yes i owe a lot to stevie you know um stevie and nova you know they um uh, they broke in around the same time they had maybe a couple of years on me you know experience wise and then get to get to work side by side with them and it's amazing how the universe puts people together you know uh stevie a fellow you know stevie's a philly kid you know nova's from an hour away in jersey 45 minutes to an hour and then somehow we all get put together and we all work together 
perfectly. You know, yeah. when I first debuted uh, on the show where the footage disappeared, you know, Stevie was wrestling Johnny Grunge. And I was the plant in the crowd, and he comes out, and me and him, like, look at each other. We both hit, he, at the time, he was doing this chop, chop, like, this thing. And we looked at each other, and we just both did it at the same time. Like, we didn't we, we didn't plan it out. We just figured we are going to react to each other. And, you know, we, we started doing things in sync and in time. And so, like, even, like, the, the ring announcer, Barbara T, is like, did you guys work that out? I was like, no. He's like, oh, that was really good. I was like. You know, and then, you know, me, Stevie, and Raven were on a show in Jersey, and Nova was there, and Raven took a liking to him. And, man, that was, that was it, and they, they put us all together. So you have a superhero and two goofs and half-shirt and Daisy Dukes with uh, this, you know, this mel- you know this dramatic, you know, Raven character. The wrestling universe put us together for a reason, and, and here we are in 2024 still still talking about it. No, it's, it's amazing. And, and you know, you obviously you've got your your beautiful kind of BWA belt behind you. I mean, I had a I had a long talk with Stephen when I spoke about a BWA and what made it so special. And he spoke a lot about kind of authenticity on your television and and how much of the real personalities went into the ECW product. I mean, for me, the BWA, you know, obviously a lot of a lot of light relief, comic comic moments, great memories from that. But it was more than that. It was a you know, it was a statement, wasn't it, against WCW and WWF? It was a we are we are here, you know, we are we are valid. We we deserve this audience and we deserve this spotlight. There, it wasn't it wasn't as simple as this is a this is a fun parody, was it? Yeah, I mean, uh, there was you know there was the one time where um, I think NWO was doing com- com- color commentary that Monday on on a Monday on Nitro. And they made a comment about a, a bingo hall or something like that. The next week, the BWO came out and we handed out bingo cards to everybody in the crowd. You know, it just nobody picks up the mic, you know, uh, B32, ho, ho, ho for the BWO or something like that. And, you know, anytime they had like a little thing about, you know, snarky comment about ECW, we, we'd, you know, pepper them back a little bit, you know. Yeah. But yeah, it just, yeah, the BWO was supposed to be a one night thing and it turned out to be, six seven months running and it led to stevie being in the main event you know co-main event of ecw's first ever pay-per-view so yeah you know going from uh you know i was i grew up a, an asthmatic kid who wasn't who shouldn't have been gotten been who shouldn't have been able to get into wrestling i got into wrestling and with you know a year and a half i'm in ecw and within two and a half years i'm part of the co-main event of ECW's first ever pay-per-view. I'm a part of, you know, when ECW invaded Raw and they picked the BWO to be a part of that. And, just, mm. and uh, you know, uh, that quarter hour of for Stevie's match against Lil Guido beat Nitro, which was insane. And that was the first public in that, in acknowledgement of the NWO. Vince was like, not to be cute, Vince McMahon goes, not to be confused with the clothing line, New World Order or NWO, <laughs> or whatever he said. He, we, we were his, uh, you know, his uh, avenue to take a jab at WCW, you know, uh, tongue in cheek. But, uh, yeah, the BWO just was this thing and it, it wasn't supposed to get over, but it got over. Like, uh, like Joey Styles said on, at, at One Night Stand, you know. For something that was supposed to be a one night thing, it shouldn't have been as successful. It, it made a boatload of money for ECW, which is insane. So, hey, but some, it's cool. Sometimes one night, one night, one night stands can lead to many special things, can't they? There's many, yeah. ma- many, many fully grown adults that are a result of a one night stand. So, I think just see yeah. a see the BWO as that. Um, yeah. I, I'm really interested. You mentioned about that. So that show in '97, that you know, the, the WWF Raw that ECW invaded. Yeah. Did you have any sense at the time as the time? Did you any of you know how much of a close relationship that actually was between Paul and Vince, which has obviously since emerged in the years to come? You, knew, you got the feeling that you got the feeling that ECW was definitely WWE friendly. Mm. And you knew that, you know, WCW was the bad guys because I mean, if you had been following wrestling just as a fan, you knew Paul had issues with WCW from when he worked there, you know, working in WCW for Bill Watts, he had his issues. So you knew 
WWE was the enemy. WWE was WWE. I mean, WWE was ECW friendly. You know, uh, guys, you know, my first couple months there, you know, Bruce Pritchard showing up to shows just hanging out in the back, you know, Tom Pritchard's in the back, you know, you know, people are just showing up just to hang out and there's no yeah. hubbub about it. So you got, you know, you were, I'm wrestling in writing Pennsylvania in a, an arena that's over top of a tattoo shop and Bruce Pritchard's just hanging out. <laughs> All right. So I guess we, we, we are WWE friendly. So, uh, and that, but you know, then you eventually you learned that, you know, you know, Vince was sending a check like once a month or whatever, but, um, I'm sorry, where were we going with that? That's <laughs> whether, whether, yeah, whether you kind of realized that actually it wasn't a war after all, but actually there was a pretty decent relationship between W breath and ECW. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you paid attention enough, you can see that, you know, when, you know, Rob Van Dam starts bringing WWE banners to the ring and Jerry Lawler's making an appearance or making an appearance. It, it, but that also, you know, helped the storyline of us versus them. You know, it was ECW versus WWE. So, you know, you know, when, uh, you know, Jerry Lawler shows up and then, you know, you know, they're beating up with Tommy dreamer and then Jim Cornette shows up and with the racket and, and yeah. you know, uh, Rob Van Dam showing up on Raw as Mr. Monday Night, you know, against, you know, Jeff Hardy, you know, just, it was easy to put two and two together, you know, just knowing you know, how, you know, Paul had worked for uh, Vince Sr., you know, uh, just, you could put two and two together, but it, it, it worked out, it helped us, you know, it put eyes on us that normally probably wouldn't have seen us otherwise, especially leading into that first pay-per-view. So, um, yeah, just uh, it, it was it's pretty obvious, you know. We raged against the machine, but we we're we raged against the machine, but we're more friendly with one machine than the other. Yeah, and I, like, I'm I'm so pleased to see Paul. You know, by the time this goes out, Paul will have been inducted into the Hall of Fame. I mean, the second I heard it was taking place in Philly, I thought this is surely from a, from both a storyline perspective and where it is, this has got to be his year. I mean, it's about you know say what you will about the hall of fame and how subjective it is and how people are chosen. But I mean, yeah. Paul, Paul Heyman's about, you know, 20 years overdue. So, um, you know, probably one of my WrestleMania highlights is the fact that I'm going to get to have a, I'm going to get Paul Heyman with a live mic, hopefully um, being allowed to talk his, share his story for a bit on that stage. Um, yeah. So much is said about Paul in terms of, you know, obviously a, a the, the kind of crazy genius, obviously, in the latter days of ECW, there's so much talk about kind of bounce checks and the financials. But, you know, I, I I would argue that no one's done, possibly done more for this business and where this business is today than Paul Heyman. I mean, what, what's, what say you on the man as someone who works so closely with him? Dude, like, when they announced him, I was kind of shocked. Not just because, not just because, excuse me, when they announced he was going in, I was shocked it was going in, not because I didn't think he belonged, but I could see Paul turning it down. You know, why are you putting me in? I am not done yet. You know, I could see him, you know, just going, Hey, I'm just getting warmed up. I'm just getting started here. But if you look at the evolution of Paul Heyman, it's been in the business since he was 15, you know, he, he's, you know, stuck in as a photographer. He was, you know, started doing color commentary for Indies in Jersey. He was dared to be a manager by Bam Bam Bigelow. So he went to Memphis and became a manager and bounced around, became a booker with Eddie Gilbert in Continental. And then, you know, uh, <clears throat> it's crazy. He's only eight years older than me, but really? I've been watching him. He's 58. I'm, I'm going to be 51 in May. So he's eight years older than me, but he's done so, he did so much before I got into business, you know, but he was only a couple of years old. He, well, it's because he was, he was basically a, a child who blagged his way into the business, didn't he? I mean, the, the stories of him in, you know, his very early days are legendary, how he managed to kind of get his, get behind the scenes in Madison Square Garden as a press photographer and stuff. I mean, he just blagged his way in, didn't he? It's incredible. Yeah. It's just, he, it kind of reminds me of, uh, Cameron Crowe, the, uh, the uh everybody knows him as a movie director now but as a kid he 
he BS'd his way into, you know, writing for Rolling Stone magazine. And then he goes on to, you know, tour with, you know, all these legendary rock bands. And then he goes, he becomes his author. And then he starts producing, he starts writing movies and producing. And he's revered as this great Paul Heyman's a lot. And a lot of ways, Paul Heyman's a lot like, you know, Cameron Crowe, where he just, you know, he has BS his way into the business and, you know, endeared himself to some, some good, you know, minds, you know, three wise men, you know, Blassie, Albano and Grand Wizard. They took a lucky to him and he learned from the best and, you know, he carried that forward. So yeah, he's had, I mean, there's people who are in the hall of fame that deserve to be in a hall of fame, but they're known for wrestling now. Paul's been in there going to a hall of fame and he's done so much from entry level all the way up to being a part of, you know, some of the greatest wrestling moments there are, you know, and you can see his fingerprints on, you know, a lot of stuff they're doing now with the, the bloodline storyline and the subtleties of everything. Like I keep saying, you know, Rocco's do the point, but he throws out the, the thumb yeah. out for the yeah. L and then you see Paul Heyman, like looking at him, like, you know, catching him, you know, throwing up the L and uh, adding that intrigue. I can see that, that to me that I see Paul's fingerprints all over that storyline and the yeah. build. I mean, when you look at ECW and they built up Sabu and Taz for a year, you know, it just, I can see his fingerprints all over. And like I said, he's nowhere close to being done. You know, he's, he's more than given enough to this wrestling business. And when you go back to ECW and the way, you know, he's, a, he's a great creative person. Maybe he was a bad businessman, but you know, just like any kind of startup business, mm -hmm. what, if you go and open up a store, you're going to be in, in, in the hole for a good while until, you know, garner, uh, you know, you know, uh, customers or fans or, and start building it up. And there's a point, you know, maybe 97 where ECW actually started making money, but they were pre pay still paying for the previous years. Mm -hmm. They're still paying for 96 and 95, you know, if they could, you know, and, um, if they could just got that, you know, they got the, the TV deal that was supposed to be the, uh, the lifeline. And then it turned out to be, that turned out to be the thing that sunk the company. But, um, Paul, Paul Heyman owes me nothing, you know, um, you know, never bounced a check on me, but you know, what he was paying me probably wasn't compared to anything he was paying anybody else because I was, again, I was only a year and a half in the business, but how do you put a price tag on the things I learned from, him, you know, yes. so essentially ECW was my college, yeah. you know, people go to college spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to learn something. And all they get is a, as a, a diploma to hang on the wall that may be worth something, you know, it, I could put this on the wall, but I have to go out there in the world and learn. So I got to learn on the job. I, you know, I went to Al's school, learned there, went to ECW and went to a whole nother level of learning from Paul Heyman, Terry Funk, Tommy Rich, Tracy Smothers, all the veterans who were there before me. So Paul Heyman gave me way more than anything you could put a dollar amount on. I'm sitting here in this house talking to you on this podcast, all because of, I, you know, Paul allowed me to express myself and, and guided me. And, you know, he wasn't above being, you know, approached and having something suggested to him because if hey if your idea works just as well as mine let's go with your idea it took pressure off of him so great talent great mind great producer of talent and uh you know like you said this this hall of fame inductions you know went well 20 years overdue but again he's he's far from finished I think that's where it shifted, isn't it? It's like you had, I, I was speaking to Kurt Angle recently and, and he was saying how, you know, he was brought brought back to go into the Hall of Fame first. And he was like, I don't want to do that because that signifies that I've finished and I still have more to give. 
but you've seen, you know, Kurt inducted Ben had another run. Rey Mysterio inducted quite recently. I think the parameters of the Hall of Fame has shifted a bit, but it doesn't have to be necessarily the final chapter. But what it is is a massive mark of respect from your peers. And yeah. I, I hate that he can enjoy the moment, despite may, maybe feeling that the spot should be to someone else. I hope he can just enjoy actually that moment of everyone applauding him for what he's brought to the business. I mean, you reference the bloodline. I mean, the tiny nuances that he has played in the last four years and that whole, you know, what what his, I don't think it's it's unquestionably the best bit of long-term story that Helen we've seen in wrestling for 25 years. And the role that he has played just by being there and like those tiny looks he might give, those little sideways glances of just the way he holds himself. He never, he's reached that point. He never has to say anything all in Paul Heyman's eyes. And I just, he's such a thing that people are going to be studying him for decades. Um, you know, as he's just incredible. Um, but I want to, I want to just quickly circle back before we get to where you are in your life now. And I want to talk about Mind of the Meanie. But before <laughs> we get to that, you referenced it at the start. You did have a WrestleMania. That was, say, 25 years ago, the last time you were in Philly. And, you know, I, I loved your Blue Dust character. I thought the Blue Dust and Gold Dust character had loads of mileage and should have gone a lot further. And I wonder whether, from my perspective, I don't know if you'll agree, but I feel like it was a slightly a casualty of that very, very fast pace of booking in 1999 and the fact that I don't think a talent roster has ever, ever been so overloaded and the fact that the mid-card was so stacked with future main eventers and i feel like you and i feel like you and gold dust if you're in a different time or era would have had a far longer run and could have been a long established tag team could have done a lot more what what's your kind of takeaway from that time i feel like the blue meanie character was maybe a decade too late you know uh mm. I, you know if it, if it had been a couple of years Oh, imagine Early. you at like SummerSlam 1992, you just like right in at Wembley Stadium. Yeah, so that that would have been amazing. But you know, uh, it is what it is, I, and I, the, the fact that you know I got to be uh, in the '80s, not late '80s type character in that '90s attitude era uh, was pretty cool. You know, the fact that I, I could do it, and it was just. Uh, you know, initially I was, you know, they brought me in WWE part of, to be a part of the job squad. And as quickly as the job squad came along, it was disbanded. So I'm sitting there going, yeah, what am I going to do? And then at the time, uh, Goldust has stole, stole Al Snow's head. And I was like, well, there's my, my in because I'd done blue dust and ECW. I, I approached Vince Russo. I said, Hey. Uh, I did Blue Dust in ECW. What if Blue Dust comes back and helps Al, you know, get head back? You know, the man who plays mind games is having his mind played with by by Blue Dust, and he, he stood there, he listened, he smiled, and it's like, yeah, we're we're going to do it. And I went from feuding with Gold Dust to being paired with him, and again, sitting under that learning tree and and traveling with you know. Uh, with Dustin and Terry and, you know, getting to do, th- I, I, I absolutely agree. If it had been any other era, we probably would have had a, a nice little run with it, but you know, you're in that, that era where everything's, you know, web it's things could pivot on the, on, on the drop of a dime. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it's all about the ratings and having mo- quick moments and stuff like that. And I remember, uh, you know, I managed Dustin at WrestleMania 15, and then the next night at Raw, I helped him win the Intercontinental Belt. And it just seemed like in a matter of weeks, he's dropping the, the Intercontinental Belt to uh, Godfather, and then they they split us up with it against the APA, and you know maybe a, a couple of weeks after uh, after Mania. So it's, it just seemed like everything happened like within a blink of an eye. But, you know, we were, you know, like you said, we, we definitely were a casualty of the booking process at that time where it's just boom, 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 boom. There was really no time to let things breathe because, mm. you know, you were going up against WWE's going up against WCW and they had to do, if, if, if you didn't garner, you know, a smidge of a, a 
whatever uh, decimal Both point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's what's the what's the key demographic? Which when a fans, you know, fans are more. It's, it's like our fans interested in the key demos. It's just, yeah. it's, just just watch the wrestling, please. I appreciate your interest in our business, but just just be a fan. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. And. I was, yeah, I was, you know, as a fan, I was interested in all the behind the scenes stuff, but I could still watch wrestling. And yeah, it wasn't until like the wrestling newsletter, I learned about the wrestling newsletter. So I was like, you know, all the behind the scenes stuff, like, you know, I loved WWE. And then you get, you get around people reading newsletters and they're like, I oh, mean, I mean, sucks. I was like, why? Yeah. <laughs> WWE is great. You know, just, but you know, it's, a sidebar for a different uh, time. You know, but I, I, I mean, through doing this, I really, really try. And I've, I tried for like the last two or three years to try and revert back to being a fan. As in, I, I, I enjoy the product more when I don't know all the behind the scenes contract negotiations and who's signing with who and who's got heat with who. I'm, yeah. I'm really, as I, as I mentioned my 40th year, I, I, I really want to regress back to how I was when I was eight, when I used to watch this thing on TV and it just captivated. And, made me feel joy you know seeing it as the business was fascinating for a long period but now i'm much more interested i love conversations like this obviously and to hear some of the behind the scenes stuff and have these moments but yeah same but when it comes to the product i want to be surprised by storylines i'd actually like to know these two are facing and i'd like to find out who wins on the night rather than hearing the backstage conjecture about oh this person hasn't signed so they've not renewed his contracts so it's gonna drop it i I just want to be a fan again, uh, to be honest. I mean, I'm entering, I'm going to WrestleMania just as a fan. I just want to be blown away by the, by the spectacle of it all, really. And um, the last thing I wanted to ask before we kind of wrap up and talk about present Day, Meanie, is... Well, um, if, if I can add one thing to... Yeah, please. Before we move on. People go, oh, kayfabe's dead. Kayfabe's not dead. There's a reason why tens of thousands of people are coming to Philly's they're coming to Philly because they don't know who, not because they know who's going to win all these matches. They want to know who's going to win. They're going in, not knowing anything. And they just want to see how it, it, it shows up. And that's because K fame, you know, just, you know, nobody knows what's going on. Do you know who's going to win between Cody and Roman? No, no. because they haven't come out and K fame's not about, exposing the business the business has been exposed since the 50s and 60s mm. you know there's been newspaper articles of wrestling fake is wrestling go on newspaper.com look up wrestling is fake and there'll be a, thousands of articles going back to the 50s and 60s people know it's predetermined or entertainment it's what we do to in the presentation of the work to not, you know, show how the magic trick's done or where the magic trick's going, sleight of hand and all that stuff is what kayfabe is. So I have to say, you know, people go, okay, kayfabe's, kayfabe's not dead. It's just misunderstood. It's Ben Bill here, host of Wrestling Life. This show is all about real talk from the talented individuals who shaped wrestling's past, present, and future. And when it comes to honoring wrestling's past, I have to give a quick shout out to the great team and our friends at BigBlueCage.com. Big Blue Cage Wrestling Store is your one-stop online shop for some truly awesome wrestling gear. Big Blue Cage's replica championship belts include the very best designs from the Golden Era, New Generation, and the Attitude Era, including the much-beloved Winged Eagle belt, the iconic Intercontinental Championship, which in my humble opinion is the greatest belt design of all time, the Attitude Era Big Eagle, and even the big gold belt, all available either in CNC or deep hand etched plates and with real leather straps. And that's not all. Big Blue Cage are also the exclusive stockists of other old school items that I absolutely love, including WWF, WCW and old school Hasbro sock sets and the one accessory that every wrestling fan's car needs, Hulk Hogan and Macho Man Randy Savage wiper blades. It's time for the mega powers to explode once again. With UK and worldwide delivery options available and custom designs accepted, head on over now to bigbluecage.com. Yeah, 
No, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Well, I mean, you know, I broke. I, you know, I started watching wrestling not realizing it. I mean, it's in, it's incredible to think about how how did I not realize at eight years old? But I didn't question it at the start. I, I felt, you know, but yeah. I think which I think helps with your kind of lifelong fandom because I was drawn into it before I was get get smartened up. But it's it's never changed my joy of it. I still to this day, I think I can predict a card, and I never can. It's why it's right. why bet, betting on wrestling has never worked. They've tried it in various variations, but you, you don't know. You never know. There's so many factors. I remember everyone being livid last year when when Cody didn't finish his story, and I was I was thrilled because I thought I'm going to Philly in 12 months' time. I really hope they can. I really hope they can slow this down, and I get to see that moment live and in person because that'll be really special. But two weeks away from it happening, I still don't know. Could change on the right. day. You never know. Right. Um, what I wanted to ask you about before before we wrap up is um yeah so I this is the closest I got to going to to one night stand I've got my one night stand t-shirt which I bought at do you remember there was a I don't know if you ever visited it but at Niagara Falls there was a huge WWE store it's like a yeah. t-shirt had a huge like undisputed title belt um so I I bought I I was a couple of months after one night stand I I was in I was in Canada and I, I bought this t-shirt and I love this t-shirt but you know. I would have given anything to be there on the night. I remember, I remember watching it through a TV screen, and just it was so special. Thinking that this, this product I love was dead to see it yeah. come come to life so vividly and perfectly for one night. And I don't want to go into the whole JBL thing. I think you've been asked that a million and one times. I know that's water under yeah. the bridge. I know you two have resolved it. That bit aside, which I know I know is very unfortunate, but that bit aside, what are your memories of? Of being part of that night and seeing it all reborn again. Uh, one night stand was a love letter to ECW fans who just had ECW yanked away from him. You know, uh, you think back to the eighties when everybody talks about black Saturday, when people tuned in to go see Georgia championship wrestling and Vince McMahon comes out and goes, welcome. You know, Where's my Georgia championship wrestling? You know, in the same way, ECW was just kind of yanked away from out of nowhere. They they were supposed to have a pay per view, and they were you know all of a sudden in in Arkansas, you know, the Pine Bluff, Arkansas, you know, was the last show. I'm like Pine Bluff, Arkansas, nothing against Pine Bluff, Arkansas, but you were just at the arena, you know, the week before. If you're going to pull the plug on the company, why not just have the last show at the arena? So you know, years go by and people it really messed people up, you know, it's just like it left a void in people's lives that, you know, you know, five years later when the, the germ of the idea starts being floated, they're doing the ESW reunion show. You're like, Ooh. and, uh, you know, I'm watching you know, them announce, you know, people for when I say, I'm like, man, they haven't called me yet. But, and dreamer calls me. He's like, you know, two weeks, two weeks before the show. Hey, me, we, we didn't have your phone number. I was like, Oh, okay. That, <laughs> That, that that makes it a little bit better, you know. Just, but um, if still, if ECW was just a perfect love letter to the fans of ECW who had ECW ripped away from them way too abruptly. Mm-hmm. That's the word I was looking for. And uh, it was awesome. It, it was awesome to see them bring every era of ECW together because there's people who are in ECW who may not have shared a locker room you know at that time you know uh eddie guerrero was on the show i was in ecw when eddie guerrero was in the company you know so i i wasn't fortunate enough to share a a locker room with eddie so it was cool to have every era of ecw represented in one show and uh just just that atmosphere And, and being you know listening to that crowd you know uh I, I watched some of the show from the, the, the gorilla position and the watch Vince McMahon watch Masato Tanaka and Mike awesome totally annihilate each other. He's like, ah, oh, oh, it's like, and that was what, you know, that was my entertainment watching Vince watch some of the stuff like, Oh, Oh, and I just, man, that was my entertainment, but it was just so cool. Did he, did he have any creative input into the night, Vince? Or was it literally he was there as a bystander and Paul was running the show? We we basically had a, uh, I won't call it production meeting, but there was a meeting, you know, that afternoon of 
one night stand where we all sat in the chairs and uh Vince and Johnny Ace were like, you know, Paul and Tommy are basically running the show. We're just here to help navigate. You know, it, it was Paul and, and Tommy running, you know, booking that show and you know, uh with the you know, WWE navigating it. And it, it, one of the cool things, this is how you how how you know a, an event is special. I had gone back to WWE for a little bit after that with the BWO and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm in an airport, I'm flying back to Philly and so a lot of the production crew are from Philly camera guys and stuff like that. And we're sitting in the airport and the, the one camera guy is like, dude, that, that I, all my years of filming shows, I never felt that environment where I call it. I, I was like that. It felt like, uh, the ACDC video for Thunderstruck, yeah. <laughs> you know, where the crowd's just like, you know, right there. The cameraman's like, yeah, I'm filming, but I'm like taking my eye out of the thing and just to look around. The camera guys were like taking their eyes out of the viewfinder just to like take a peek around and absorb that. And I, I think the, the, the peak of that show was Sam Ann's entrance, mm. you know, talking to JBL, which, which unfortunately you know, with, um, you know, on the network doesn't have the same pop because obviously they haven't retained it's such a shame because his music was just everything, wasn't it? And, coming out to generic rock and seeing that entrance just doesn't doesn't work at all no that's the that's the only downfall of ecw is the, the music you know you, everybody goes ecw and i'm being paying for well, you know, a lot of wrestling promotions back in the day didn't pay for wrestling li or licenses we were just happened to be the last one you know but you know talking to jbl he's like man that entrance you know just you know you, the rock goes like this it shows his goosebumps Everybody in that building, we were all just one giant goosebump, you know, when the uh, key, you know, enter Sandman. Well, that's, know, that's what I mean about look at, look at Tommy's face, you know, it's just that's what I mean about the Doncaster show. I know it's not the same, but I feel so privileged that I still I got to be there for a Sandman entrance, and it wasn't yeah. quite the same, but it was it felt so visceral. It was just it's like just this kind of holy moment for a couple of minutes. It's incredible. The um. There are there are three shows I think or moments in wrestling that always give me goosebumps. One would be um, Canadian Stampede with the Heart Foundation and that Calgary crowd was just spine tingling. The second would be One Night Stand, which is just from beginning to end just beautiful that crowd reaction. And the third would be Rock and Hogan at WrestleMania 18. Just these these moments that just the crowd doesn't matter how many times you watch it they just immediately just make the hair stand up on your, on your arms. And um, there, there's, you know, I just loved that one night stand show from beginning to end. And as a, as a, as a fan, I was just so grateful it happened as that, as you say, as that, I know it wouldn't be the bookend. It should have been the bookend, but um, you know, right. but you know, the, a perfect finale that we never got before. Um, how, how long was it before without getting kind of into the instant, but how long was it before you and JBL kind of were able to, to patch things up and move forward. One night stand happened. And then, uh, I start writing blogs and, you know, rallying against what happened to me and, you know, and making some noise and whatever I was doing was creating buzz and WWE is all about buzz. And dreamer called me and said, Hey, uh, <laughs> want to bring you into, and here's the thing. And, it's God's honest truth. Nova had pitched to me, said to me the afternoon of when I stand that they were thinking Stevie was going to go from velocity to SmackDown. And they were thinking about having the BWO come back as like a thing. Cause SmackDown colors are blue and white. BWO is blue and white. This, that, and other thing. I was like, Hey man, I'm available. <laughs> He's like, yeah. Nova's like, yeah. I, I said, I don't think me and he would, uh, turn it down. I was like, all right. But then the one night stand thing happened. I start writing the blogs. I start, you know, saying, Hey, this is screwed up. This is fucked up. And then dreamer calls, Hey, uh, we want to bring you out to uh, Sacramento. This has nothing to do with the JBL thing. Uh, you know, bring back the BWO for a little bit. Uh, all right. So I go back, uh, they fly me out to Sacramento. Uh, Johnny Ace pulls me aside. He goes, 
yeah, tonight you're working JBL. I was like, what? I was like, dreamer, you know, it just didn't matter to me. I was, he's like, he's like, you're going to work. Well, it did matter at the time in hindsight, you know, yeah, every, everybody's in, you know, everything looks clear with 2020 hindsight, but he goes, mm-hmm. Hey, you're wrestling John tonight. Uh, you're going to hit the moon. So you're winning the match. One, two. I was like, does John know this? <laughs> so, uh, Oh yeah, he loves it. Just that and the other thing. And I'm standing there. I'm walking around like, what have I got myself into? And uh Triple H comes up to me and goes, Hey man, you all right? You look a little you look a little worried. I was like, Yeah. Uh I was brought back, you know, thinking it's gonna be with the BWO and they got me working with JBL and you know what happened to us. I, I feel like I'm kind of being set up here. He went, wait one minute. <laughs> You went, walked away, came back like two or three minutes. Later. He goes, follow me. So I followed Triple H into Vince's office. And Vince is sitting there eating a steak. <laughs> Manny, I'll be right with you. And he's watching the, uh, the early versions of Hogan knows best on some monitor, you know, whatever. Manny, go have a seat on my couch. And I go and sit on the couch and what the fuck, man, this is crazy. And he had to, you know, it, he comes in and, you know, Triple H goes, Meanie's got some uh, trepidation or whatever, you know, some, I explained, hey, I gave him the, the cliff notes of everything that happened, you know, and he goes, well, I guarantee you, Meanie, uh, if John does anything in that match, he will be fired, you know, just like, all right, take him at his word, you know, and then uh, I'm standing there and then uh, JBL comes up to me, he goes, you want to have a talk? I was like, absolutely. Let's go have this talk. And uh, if you've ever been to TV or if you've watched any behind the scenes thing from WWE, there's signage everywhere. There's catering, there's seamstress, there's Vince's office, there's this, that, and the other thing. And we're walking into a part of the building where I'm seeing less and less signage. <laughs> I'm just like, man, if we walk into a room and there's plastic on the floor, I'm running. You know, like... <laughs> If this is like a, a mob hit, I'm I'm out of here, right? You know, I grew up in a land I know what the mob does, you know. Uh so I go stand in the middle of the room. He turned around, locked the door, and turned around. I was like, we could fight or we can make money. I was like, brother, I never wanted to fight you in the first place. And that's the God's honest truth. I was I was a fan of Justin Hawk Bradshaw. Mm-hmm. I was a fan of Bradshaw. I was a big fan of Stan Hansen growing up and he reminded me of, you know, yeah, the yeah. Hansen type game, ass kicker, you know, kind of character. And I laid it out to him. I was like, Hey man, it's all because, you know, when I left in, I got fired in 2000, I was there from 98, 2000. I said, you know, I enjoyed my time and I did an interview and I said, I enjoyed my time in WWE, but JBL was a bully. And just like anything, you know, you, you hear the, you know, this, you know, the, the grapevine or the telephone game, tell one person, they tell another person. And I'm sure by time, whatever me saying JBL was a bully, by the time I got to JBL, it probably grew legs and became something totally different. Right. Mm. And he had, you know, you know, the boys are the boys and they're probably egging them on, you know, just this, that, and the other thing. And I was like, Hey man, this is all I said. I said, you're a bully and this is what you did when I was here. And he was like, well, I, I don't remember any of that. And, take him at his word because those attitude error days were crazy days, you know, hard, hard traveling, you know, you know, days. So he takes somebody at their word and he apologized. We shook hands and then we went about our way of how to turn a real crappy situation into a storyline into pro wrestling. We ain't the first two guys to ever had a, a physical altercation in a match. You know, Bill Watts would knew if guys had heat in the locker room, we put them in a room and tell them to fight. And mm. once they got it out of their system, they went out and, you know, had a great match. And not that that's like good, you know, practice, <laughs> but we weren't the first time we weren't the last, nice. but we were able to get past the thing that happened to us. And, you know, later on, he would go on to, you know, he pitched me for the Royal Rumble in Philly. Uh, there was a Royal Rumble in Philly and I had WWE hired me and Stevie to do uh ECW on release volume three. I was like, man, that would be awesome. You know, 
I'm doing this DVD for Philly uh, for uh, EC, uh, ECW WWE Royal Rumbles in Philly. What better way than you know ha- have a Philly surprise in Philly? Saying, "Well, here comes the host of ECW on release volume three, the Blue Meanie, and all that." And I yeah. started trying to do it in one line campaign, and JBL was pitching me to the office. And it came down to it was between me and Bubba Ray, and they chose Bubba Ray, which is awesome. I love Bubba Ray, so I popped for him. But that was JBL going, hey, yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, that's respect, isn't it? That's, that's you know, two men working through their differences. Yeah. You misunderstand it. It hasn't been dealt with well, but you've moved past it. And through that, you get professional respect. And I think there's a, there's a learning. Misunderstanding, there, I'm sure. With, yeah. I mean, misunderstanding, I'm sure people augmented along the way by yeah. me saying he was a bully. And by the time it got to his ears. Oh, wait till you hear what Meanie said about you, you know? Yeah, and the majority of workplace misunderstandings don't usually result in you getting bludgeoned. But, um, you know, <laughs> it's it's yeah. it's the same principle, isn't it? But you work through it, mutual respect was there, and you've come out better for it the other side. But but obviously not before Stevie pretty much killed him with a steel chair in that match. Ooh. <laughs> but, uh, you know, yeah, you know, it, it was a little bit harsher than, you know, somebody at work putting fish in a microwave. You know, just... just uh, <laughs> Certain things you just do don't do at your job, you know. It was, but yeah, that chair shot. Uh, and you know, Stevie felt so bad about it. You know, we got to the to the gorilla position, the gorilla position, and we waited for JBL to apologize to him. You know, mm. no nah, man, it was an accident. Things happened, and, and uh, he told us to go online and just put over that it was a receipt. It's not the other thing. Yeah, but uh, yeah. It was a horrible situation that that worked itself out. Yeah, and it's 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 a moment in time which, as you say, these things get they they get they get bigger as the as the internet goes. I mean, I can only imagine what that incident would be like now if it had been taking place in twenty twenty four with yeah. technology and you know Instagram reels and everything else. You can only imagine how much people would have people with cell phone own. cameras exactly you know. would have been different. Um, look, I want to I want to kind of bring bring this up bang up to date uh, before we wrap. So twenty twenty four. You know, Brian Heffron. So, you know, you're a trainer these days, you're you're two hundred plus episodes into the mind of Femini now, which is which is insane. I mean, I know this as a as a podcaster myself, how much time goes into that. So all the credit in the world to you for for kind of staying the course and reaching that point. Um what what's keeping you driven and, and kind of creatively motivated these days? Uh just being able to enjoy the fruits of my labor. Uh, yeah, I got to do things in WWE and ECW and, you know, I wake up every morning and my body, uh, tells me, it reminds me of everything I've done. I'm at the weird stage where I'm like, Ooh, is that a wrestling related thing? Or is that just a getting old type thing? I, I don't know. I don't, it could be a little bit of both. Bit of both. Yeah. But, uh, over my, in my life, you know, I've done interviews like this and people are like, man, you need to write a book. You need to do a podcast. That was always a little. I was like, how do you do it? You know, do, what do I talk about? You know, uh, do I do it by myself? Like a, like a you know, diary? Do I have gas? And eventually I just got down to the point where I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And, uh, here we are 200 episodes later. I've me and my co-host Adam Bernard, uh, just recently, uh, did two, our 200th episode and, it, it you know we it was something I was going to do, and then the lockdown happened, and it, it's it's weird how you know I wanted to go into a professional studio, this that, and everything, and the lockdown happened, and then the beauty of doing things over Zoom happened, and you know I could do my podcast from home, and he could do his podcast where he lives, and uh, mind and meaning, it's just it's a, it's a great avenue just to just to talk. I'm a big fan of hearing a great conversation. I grew up on talk radio, just listening to two people talk the art of having a conversation, which I think in a way, sometimes I hate to be that guy. social media killed conversation, but in a way, social media has kind of killed the art of having a conversation. It's, kill, it's killed for long form conversation, yeah. hasn't it? The deep dive, like we're having now talking for an hour and a half, really getting into the weeds of things that, you know, yeah. we've lost that bit. And, and I love that. I, I I, I love my favorite thing in the world is going out for a long walk with a good, you know, two hour long podcast and really getting into the, the two way conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what it is. We talk about everything 
We say our motto is movies, music, sports, and tons of useless knowledge. And a lot of times I go into the, you know, into an episode, not even know what I'm going to talk about. You know, he does, Adam does the intro and he goes, Meanie, what's on your mind? And I go, and just start talking. And before you know it, we're an hour in and we're wrapping up and we're reading our end credits. And it's like, oh, well, that went quick. And, you know, that's, that's been fine. You know, I, I get to do, you know, the podcast. I'm doing a lot of other projects. I'm uh, part of a, a video game that's coming out, uh, hopefully later this year called Ultra Pro Wrestling, uh, which is going to be a nod to the old uh, N64 games, you know, No Mercy, WrestleMania 2000, that type of game. Yes. Uh, those folks are doing a, an amazing job. I get to see a little bit of the sneak peek stuff that hasn't been announced yet, but I'm waiting for, I'm a, I'm, I can't wait for this game to come out. So I'm doing that. I got action figures doing the podcast, doing conventions. Uh, I was training guys a lot, you know, for a little bit, but you know, my personal schedule got a little screwed up, but I, uh, you know, I had, you know, a couple of students over at the, in the monster factory in Jersey who were, who've gone on to do great things. You know, uh, guys like Matt Riddle, Damian Priest, Steve Macklin, who's in TNA right now. Um, uh, Ian Riccoboni, uh, a bunch of kids who are doing good stuff. But right now I'm at the age where it's like, you know, I just want to enjoy the fruits of my labor and be able to do pick and choose what I do. I don't, I get in a ring, but, uh, it's, it's really got to pique my interest. You know, it's just the days of just driving 400 miles and, you know, uh, doing something in waiting, you know, four days to, you know, before I can actually feel normal or, you know, uh, if, if, you know, those days are kind of winding down, if it's, if it's something like, you know, I just worked for MLW up in New York, I worked for him in Philly, stuff like that's fun, you know, just, but you know, it, it just, I want to do things, you know, I want to be creative and uh, I want to help out wherever I can help. You know, if, if somebody's got an idea or needs help, you know, I, I'd be happy to add my two cents or, you know, if any, you know, I just want to get back to the business giving me so much, you know, because God knows I shouldn't have made it into this business. Uh, and I was able to carve out a, a little spot. You know, I got to be a part of ECW during their hottest period. I got to be a part of attitude during their, their, their hottest period. And that's allowed me to just have a career and have a, an avenue to not only be a fan, but, interact with fans and stuff yeah. like that. And I, mean, I, I got to do awesome stuff like this. And well, like you've, 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 you've given us a lot on behalf of your fans. I'm a big fan of your work. You know, thank you for memories because you. you know, it's, you probably overlook that bit sometimes, but actually you've given us a lot of special moments and wrestling is all ultimately about joy and escapism. And yes. you know, you, you've served that up in, in plentiful supply. Um, and I'm grateful for your time. We've gone well over what we agreed, and um, you know, <laughs> I could I could talk to you all day. But um, it's always it's always lovely. I always love doing this and get an opportunity to speak to people who, I, who I've watched from a screen and looked up to, and then and then realizing that they're even nicer in real life is uh, always a joy, my friend. So thank you for your time. It just makes life easier, you know. Um, what not being a fun. not being a dick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just you know I. You know, I was a, I was a kid. I met hot stuff, Eddie Gilbert you know, as a teenager. He was awesome. I'm a teenager. I'm going, I get a photo. Cause he's like, yes, sir. No, sir. This, that, you know, sir. I'm, I'm, I was like, if I ever get to be anything in wrestling, I want to treat fans the way Eddie Gilbert treated me. So just, you know, I want to be that person, you know, the, the you know, give people good memories, you know, people invest their time people have invested their time in me and it just makes life easier just to let people know. I appreciate, you know, what they've done for me, you know? Well, uh, we, we appreciate you, Brian, appreciate your time, appreciate everything you've given us today. And one of these days, we're going to get you over to the UK. I would love to, man. Me, I love me me and Mrs. Mean to come over and have a little bit of business, a little bit of pleasure, you know? Absolutely. Well, hit, hit me up. I'll give you a tour of the Southwest. Take you, take you around beautiful bath. Awesome, man. That'd be that would be amazing. Yeah. Well, look, I always wrap up with a couple of thanks. Obviously, thank you to my guest, Brian, aka the Blue Meanie. Um, 
Thank you to my producer, Jeff Easton from Tall Eight Productions. I love this. Whenever I say his name on YouTube, his little face will pop up just here. Um, <laughs> thank you to all of our, all of you for joining us. So there's a lot of podcasts out there. Meanie's got a brilliant one. Check it out. Oh, what are your socials, by the way? I always ask for people's socials. Plug if away. You would like to, yeah, if you, if you would like to follow Blue Mini on all forms of social media, at Blue Mini BWO. Uh, if you want to follow my podcast, it's at Mind of the Meanie on all forms of social media. If you want to listen to Mind of the Meanie podcast, drops every Monday morning, wherever you get your favorite podcast, uh, mind of the meanie uh, you know, all that good stuff. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Thank you for your time. <laughs> and thank you for allowing me to come on here and, and promote some uh, wrestling tees. If you'd like a sweet blue BWO shirt, wrestling tees.com slash blue meanie, uh, get yourself a BWO shirt and, or, there's a lot of shirts out on there I designed myself, but you know, just uh, thank you for your time and uh, thank you for allowing me to interact with you and tell my story to a, a wider audience. Yep. So everyone, you heard the man. Go and support the blue guy. Go to Pro Wrestling Tees. Listen to his podcast. I'll put all the stuff in the show notes here. Um, but yeah, just show your love. And what we'd love to do is if you can um, use a hashtag Wrestling Life Pod when you've checked out this episode. Let Brian and I, I know what you think. Share him some love, share some memories and leave a nice review if you can because that makes a massive difference in the world of podcasting. Um, so that's us done for today. I've been Ben Veal. He's been the Blue Meanie. This has been Wrestling Life. Be good to each other. See you soon. Bye.